The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Blue-green algae is a well-known problem in Lake Erie, but now it's even in the icy deep waters of Lake Superior. Tonight, as part of our ongoing partnership with the Council of the Great Lakes Region, we're assessing this critical watershed and what's needed to get serious about confronting climate change. Also, writer Britt Ray talks to Nam Kiwanuka about eco-anxiety and her new book, Generation Dread, that finds ways to make a difference amid the climate crisis. It's Tuesday, June 28th, and that's next on The Agenda. As summer heats up, so do some of the most troublesome threats to the Great Lakes and their environs. Algae blooms, invasive species, extreme weather events that seem to be increasing in frequency and severity in different ways in each lake. With us now from this year's Great Lakes Economic Forum in Chicago, Illinois, and we will introduce our guests, as is our custom, from furthest away to closest to our studio. There he is in Chicago, Howard Lerner, President and Executive Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center. In Amherstburg, Ontario, on the shores of the Detroit River, Katie Stamler, water quality scientist and source water protection project manager at the Essex Region Conservation Authority. She's also an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Windsor's Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research. And in Mississauga, Ontario, near Pearson Airport, on his way to the conference, Patrick Widase Madabi, former Anishinaabek Nation Grand Council Chief. And it's great to have you all with us here on TVO tonight. Katie, get us started, please. When we're talking algae bloom, I'm going to assume that some people watching this right now don't know what that is. So tell us what it is and how it's harming the Great Lakes, if you would. Yeah, for sure. So in Lake Erie and in Lake St. Clair, we have uh, annual harmful algal blooms, and they're an overgrowth of uh, blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. So the species that are blooming currently in both of those lakes is uh, something called microcystis, and uh, it's a very specific uh, type of blue-green algae. And that particular cyanobacteria can produce a toxin called microcystin. And that's why we're watching it because, uh, you know, when that stuff blooms and it creates those toxins, it can create a threat to our drinking water and make uh, water unsafe for our pets and animals to drink. We've got several factors that play into that. Climate change is a big one with the warming temperatures and the change in precipitation factors, uh, as well as phosphorus runoff. So phosphorus is the nutrients that feed those algal blooms. Um, so you see a lot of that sort of green area around the shores, and that's what our algal blooms are in uh, in those two Great Lakes. Howard, I gather you're going to be speaking about this at the conference in Chicago, and in particular how it relates to Lake Erie. Uh, focus on that, that's if you right. would, for a second. What's your concern about what's taking place in Lake Erie? You know, Lake Erie is a binational embarrassment in terms of almost every summer there being harmful algae blooms. And Katie described the science very well. Uh, the problem is when the microtoxins, in effect, go up, it makes the water dangerous in terms of people's health and animal health and well-being. You know, a lot of people love to spend their time in Lake Erie. It's where we live, where we work, where we play. And when those algae blooms are out there, everybody just says, yuck. You know, it's not a place that's enjoyable for recreation, for kayaking, canoeing, for swimming, for boating. Uh, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that Ontario, the states of Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio agree to was designed to reduce phosphorus, which causes the toxic algae blooms. What the four, three states in the province need to do is step up together, and all of them are not there yet. They're nowhere close to the goals that they agreed to in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and that means almost every summer we have harmful algae blooms, sometimes worse, sometimes bad, and sometimes not so good but none of that should be acceptable for the future. We can and should do better than that. Katie, let me just do a quick follow-up with you in as much sure. as Lake Erie is a relatively small Great Lake. It's a warm Great Lake, relatively speaking again. Um, I guess I suspect people understand how the algae blooms can, take, can happen in that body of water. Lake Superior is very big and it's very mm -hmm. cold and the algae blooms are happening there. How did it happen there? 
That's an excellent question. And there's lots of scientists who are greater than I am that are working on that that particular problem. Problem. Um, I think it was just um, a perfect Oof. storm of events there, right? You had uh, a really large runoff event, the temperatures were warm enough, and it was a very localized algal bloom. Um, and it, it happened that uh, that one time a couple of years ago and certainly raised a lot of alarm bells. You know, if it can happen in Lake Superior, where else can it happen? And we look at, uh, there are some inland lakes in Northern Ontario that are experiencing harmful algal blooms with that same cyanobacteria. Um, and there's some, um, sort of the, the latest and, and coolest science going on is looking not just at phosphorus, which is the thing that we can manage. So that's why we, we talk about phosphorus so much because we can reduce the amount of food that we give to the algae. So that's, that's where we put our efforts into trying to reduce that nutrient load. But climate change is really a really big factor for it. So the um, the latest science is looking at the species themselves and how they respond to water temperatures. So that that microcystis, the the cyanobacteria that's blooming currently, is really good at adapting to those warmer temperatures. So it's doing really well in those warmer temperatures and out competing the more uh, native diatom type species. So that's why we're seeing that that change in the type of algae that's blooming in uh, in those temperatures. All right, Patrick, let me get you into this conversation now. I wonder if you could tell us where your community is and how it's been affected by all of this. I live on uh, Manitoulin Island, a small First Nation called Ondek Omniconic, but um, it's right on the North Channel of Lake Huron. And uh, I'm not a scientist, but I have looked at, uh, you know, uh, changes in water for probably 60, close to 65 years. And... Um, you know, I think, um, you know, the science community has lots of answers about different things that are going on, but I think it's really a, a lot to do with the pressures of uh, humankind around the lakes. And, uh, you know, you see a large concentration of cottages now. Uh, it was mentioned about the phosphorus levels that are being dumped into the rivers, you know, uh, stuff uh, that's now being regulated, but there's been an accumulated uh, impact over many years you know, I, I still see, saw, you know, uh, sailboats dumping ballast in bays, you know, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And now it's more regulated now. But uh, you still hear things of, uh, you know, spills, uh, uh, you know, even from on the highways that eventually seep down through the waters, into the water systems, through the creeks, off of railway lines. Uh, there's just so many factors, uh, high concentration of cottages around, uh, around the water bodies. And, uh, you know, the, the septic systems don't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, uh, contain the water. It, uh, you know, Mother Nature has a good way of, uh, you know, water is powerful. It can move wherever it wants to go. I mean, you can see, if you travel along the highways, you'll see water coming out of a rock face. That's just how, how powerful water is. Hmm. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of different factors, and a lot of it's accumulated factors over many years. And the weather and, uh, and, and nature is about... I think six weeks out of whack, maybe even more, you know, where you see the temperatures are not like they used to be. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a guy that likes to fish and, uh, you know, the water temperatures where, uh, you know, I go fishing uh, are not the same. It's either colder or war too warm and uh, uh, the catch is not the same. Hmm. Howard, as you have looked at this issue over, I presume, many decades, can you tell us, I, 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 I want to get a sense about how bad it is now compared to the worst you've ever seen it. Where are we right now on that? Well, the worst we ever saw it is about um, eight years ago when the city of Toledo, half a million people, water supply was unsafe. So for 72 hours, people in Toledo couldn't drink the local water and water had to be trucked in by the the Army National Guard in the state of Ohio. So that was the peak, that was the worst. And I think that was a call to action for people in the states that we've let this get too bad, we've got to do something about it. Uh, but let's look at very quickly the problem and the solution. And, and Katie and Patrick have described it overall quite right. The problem is phosphorus. And almost all the phosphorus is getting into Lake Erie is coming from the agricultural sector. So in the state of Ohio, the Ohio EPA says 90% or more of the phosphorus comes from the agricultural sector. That's two places. That's fertilizer runoff from corn and soy fields, and that's uh, manure that's running off from CAFOs. CAFOs, you know, 
animal operations with 5,000 pigs or hogs or 8,000 cattle, they produce poop. That poop gets collected in a manure pond and then it gets sprayed and spread on fields. It leaks into the water supply, goes through the Maumee River system, goes into Lake Erie. So when you're dealing with the problem here and you try to craft solutions, the biggest source of phosphorus is agricultural runoff, and that's manure coming from the animal operations, and that's fertilizer coming from the crop fields. And we know what to do about that. We need to reduce it. And what the experts say, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement says, phosphorus needs to be reduced by 40% by 2025 in order to alleviate harmful algae booms in nine out of 10 years. In which right? case, how do you do that? That requires action, and that requires the states and the province to do that together. Because if Ohio, for example, reduces by 40% and Indiana doesn't, or if Ontario does and Michigan doesn't, we'll still have the same problem. We're all in this together, and we need to focus on agricultural runoff manure that's coming from large concentration uh, animal operations and fertilizer runoff. That's the source of the problem. That needs to be where we go for solutions. All right, we know we know what needs doing. I guess the question then, Katie, is how do we get there from here? Is there a way to do that? Sure, there's lots of actions that are already happening. And um, in Ontario, things are a little bit different. We don't have as many of those CAFOs that they have in the Maumee Basin. Uh, so it's it's more of that row crop agriculture that we see. There's a, a recent paper by Marin McRae and Kevin King and others that talk about really place-based solutions and looking at the different types of farming and the different type of land that's in each area and finding the right solution for phosphorus reduction in each of those places. So in some places that might be um, going from a conventional mulberry tilling to going to a no-till or, or conservation tillage. You might be looking at something like controlled drainage or uh, using cover crops. So there's lots of different agricultural solutions that we can find out there. Um, some of them require really big investments. We have some cost share programs where we help the farmers with some of those big investments. Um, and really, you know, talking about education and and not just with the farmers because they they know this stuff, right? They're they're not necessarily over utilizing fertilizer, you know. So we we have to talk about how do we try to keep that fertilizer on the ground? And they're some of our best advocates for doing that because they don't want to lose it either. Um, so you know, making sure that we've got those programs in place to help them to do that. And I think too, you know, something that I always talk about when I speak with the public or with the youth or, or with our lifelong learners is showing our respect as individuals for these big actions that need to be taken. So what can we do as, as individuals as well, right? Looking for those phosphate-free detergents, using water responsibly, fertilizing our own lawns responsibly. We don't need to have the greenest lawn in the neighborhood either. So there, there's these small actions that we as individuals can take that show respect for those larger actions that we're asking of our, of our farmers and of our municipalities. Now, Patrick, you told us earlier that you've been watching this subject for going on more than six decades now. And I wonder if during the course of that time, uh, you have had to launch uh, legal actions, for example, or have seen legal actions launched in order to make progress on that. What can you tell us on that front? Well, probably one of the biggest uh, concerns was raised by the elders of the Robinson Huron Treaty area, which is uh, the North Shore and Manitoulin Highway 69 corridor First Nations. There's about 21 First Nations in that area. We're very concerned about aerial spraying. You know, the forestry companies are spraying, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, limit the growth of uh, the, the trees that they uh, they consider useless because of, uh, you know, trying to grow the, uh, the products that they want. So what happens is that they don't understand that that, that stuff gets into the groundwater, it goes into all the creeks, into the into the water bodies. A lot of our area is uh, rock formation, so uh, it's very easy for this water to, you know, disseminate across a lot of areas. And the animals uh, uh, drink the water, uh, we as First Nations, uh, you know, uh, use these animals as part of our livelihood, uh, uh, whether it's uh, birds, uh, uh, whether it's uh, rabbits, whether it's uh, moose or deer. And, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, cancer type uh, 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 things inside the uh, bodies of these animals now that some of these animals, you, 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 when you harvest them, they're not, you can't even eat them now. And uh, so it's very concerning. Uh, they've been trying to raise this uh, with different levels of government, 
And I really uh, applaud those elders for uh, that fight that's going on. It's an ongoing fight. Uh, the forestry companies try to say, and the government uh, tries to say that this stuff is not harmful and it's not put out there in sufficient uh, quantities. But yet, uh, you know, uh, the, the incidence of cancer is rising. You know, we pick berries, we eat berries, we pick medicines out there on the land, and uh, they, they don't they don't care about that. They just want to get this stuff. Hmm. That's what they want. I, uh, I, I take it that was a greenback that you put before the camera there. It was a pretty quick shot. Looked like U.S. currency, too, I think. Okay. Um, Howard, I wonder if you could pick up on that and talk about how much success you have seen in the courts in order to make progress on this. We filed an action in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio, and the state of Ohio has been dragging its heels and the federal government um, beginning to do a little better, but still has a long way to go. Look, th there's a math problem here that's very straightforward and simple. Ohio is responsible for about 70% of the phosphorus that gets into Lake Erie uh, among the states. Okay, so it's the big dog in terms of the amount of phosphorus pollution. 90% of that pollution, according to the state of Ohio, comes from the agricultural sector. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that the state of Ohio and Indiana and Michigan and the province of Ontario have signed says they have to reduce by 40%. You can't reduce by 40% if you're not reducing from the agricultural sector, which is 90%. Hmm. You just can't do it. People can clean up their lawns and that's fine for the other 10%, but you don't get a 40% reduction unless you do two very serious things in the agricultural sector. First, everything Katie's talking about, about voluntary actions by farmers are good things. Nobody wants to have their arm twisted and broken. But the fact of the matter is, if you have a large uh, cornfield and you're applying fertilizers at a level that too much of it is draining off into the river system that's creating harmful algae and toxic algae blooms in Lake Erie, you got to reduce that. Because if you don't reduce it, the people there at the end of the line, the folks who are around Lake Erie, which we all love, are dealing with harmful algae blooms every summer. And the second is, we have to stop permitting more CAFOs. The, the more large animal operations you have with 10,000 cattle, 6,000 hogs, uh, 8,000 chickens, these animals produce poop. It's just part of what they do. And if you have more poop and it gets spread on the fields, it will predictably go into the water system and it will go into Lake Erie. And for the state of Ohio to keep allowing there to be more of these large animal facilities, set aside the animal welfare issues there, which are serious, but they produce more poop and the bad problem gets worse. That requires policy action, it requires regulation, that permitting has to change because voluntary actions won't get us to solutions. All the scientists know that. And unless we're willing to tolerate Lake Erie having harmful algae blooms summer after summer after summer and all the bad consequences of that, then we need to go to the biggest sources of the problem which are manure that are coming from the large animal operations and fertilizer runoff and take serious policy actions to reduce them. So we achieve the goal that the three states and the provinces signed on to and said they were going to achieve by 2025, reducing phosphorus by 40% in order to begin to clean up Lake Erie. We know what we need to do. The policymakers need to get moving make the hard actions, and actually do that together. And I get there's a lot of reluctance to do that, but if they want to solve the problem, that's what they have to do. And I think everybody knows that, and it's whether they have the political will and the courage to move forward to do that. Otherwise, we're looking at summer after summer of problems in the way that Patrick and Katie have described it and I've described it. We need to get out of that. And to do that, we need to target our efforts on the places that are causing 90% of the problem. Well, Katie, let me follow up with you on that. I know you'd like to get on that journey, mostly through education and cooperation. If it can be done that way, that's always preferable. But at the end of the day, is it likely that this basically gets done only by going to court? What's your view? 
Well, I, I have no legal background whatsoever, so I don't necessarily want to want to get into the the legal side of things. But you know, there there are there are lots of ways that that we can do this, and and our farmers want to do it without having to get to the the legal side of things, right? And it, we can go to um, companies as well, right? When we look at our fertilizer companies that sell the fertilizer product. When our farmers are going to them with their with their data and saying how much fertilizer should I put on, it's part of the responsibility of those fertilizer companies to give them the lower numbers, right? And and they want to sell more fertilizer, so they're they're giving them those higher numbers. Whereas if we use uh, the numbers that the that OMAFRA provides, which is the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture Rural Affairs, um, their numbers would be lower. So trying to to put the least amount of fertilizer on to still get good yield so that our farmers aren't, aren't losing yield is really important. And there's a way to, to do that, um, you know, without having to, to drop a hammer on our farmers. But do we need to have some stronger legislation? Yes, I think so. And I think that there are some, um, some options to do that without, um, without really having to drop a hammer on, uh, on the farmers. Well, Patrick, uh, our, you, discussion, our discussion, our discussion, just might yeah, go ahead. Clarify Howard. one thing. Going sure. to court is the last resort. Hmm. Yeah. What we really hope is that our policymakers and politicians put the right policies into place, Yes. whether it's legislation or regulation, so we get progress and we don't have to go to court. Going to court is what you do when nothing else is working. Gotcha. Uh, our conversation so far has sounded, um, you know, uh, rather grim, I have to say. And we are, you know, because there are significant issues out there and big problems that need solving. But we don't want this occasion to pass without pointing out that on the 50th anniversary of the Great Lakes Agreement, and I'll bring you in for this, Patrick, there are presumably some things worth celebrating. Presumably. You tell me if I'm wrong. But uh, what would you put on that list, Patrick, of things worth celebrating on this anniversary? Probably the most significant thing that I'm thinking about is the chance to do better. Uh, we've had 50 years, uh, a lot of talk, uh, some action, but not enough action. And uh, you know, the two other guests have uh, you know, highlighted a number of things that could be done, but it's each, each person's responsibility to look uh, for generations ahead. And unfortunately, the many stakeholders that are receiving economic benefit of this thing are, are, uh, are not looking that far ahead. And, uh, you know, when you see things happening where, uh, you know, overflow of uh, sewage systems in some of these major cities gets dumped into the water systems, and then uh, fast forward a few months later, you know, they're all surprised, surprised. There's something going on with the aquatic life in the area. You know, we need some good common sense to be practiced right across the the whole uh, uh, Great Lakes area here because, you know, this is one of the largest freshwater bodies in the world. And, uh, you know, we're, we're at our own peril here. If we don't, uh, you know, smarten up, use some good common sense about uh, about things, and then we shouldn't have to be going into these forums of, uh, you know, the courts. Uh, it costs big money. These companies have got so much at stake. They throw all their resources at you. And usually environmental groups and, and folks uh, you know, like the First Nations, we don't have these types of resources to combat that. So I, I think people have to take personal responsibility. And there's lots of things that, uh, you know, just individual little practices about, you know, we just use too much water individually. You know, I, uh, Josephine Mendamenbach used to tell us about even when you turn on a tap to have, brush your teeth or shave, you know, turn the tap off when you're not using it. You know, uh, how much water do we waste uh, you know, as individuals. And so we got to start thinking consciously about uh, protecting the water. Well, Patrick, let me follow up with you on this, because we've done a number of programs related to the Great Lakes on this program in the past. And one of the things I think we've all learned is that it is the combination of both rigorous scientific knowledge brought to bear to solve problems, along with uh, what shall we call it? Traditional knowledge and historic knowledge provided by indigenous groups. And together, that's an irresistible combination. Can you tell us more about the latter? What is it that indigenous people, in terms of their traditional knowledge, can help bring to this challenge to help solve it? Well, let me point out one thing, first of all. Uh, yes, there's lots of traditional knowledge out there, but even our people are thinking about new... Uh, new ways of trying to protect water, you know, and combining some of the you know, modern science with our thinking. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, the meticulous study that our people do of nature. You know, uh, how many people will go and watch what an ant does for hours at end? 
you know, to see mm -hmm. what it does and how what its role in, in nature is. And if you look at that with the plant life and with uh, all of the aquatic species, the animal life, the bird life, and, and study that for generations, and, and you know, that's how you learn. You, you just don't, uh, you know, pick up a book and automatically you have the answer about how to deal with uh, Mother Nature. Mother Nature will always win. You got two thumbs up from the other guests on the program. I could see them both smiling when you described that. Yes, indeed. Katie, talk to us about conservation authorities. What role do they play in resolving all of this? Sure. So we're we're local watershed based organizations and our, our job is really to be on the ground and, and working with the people. So uh, a lot of us have stewardship programs uh, where we're able to offer those cost share programs to our um, our agricultural community and our rural communities, things like offering cover crop um money to help put in cover crops, doing nutrient management planning, erosion control to help kind of keep the, the sediment in the, in place. We do tree plantings and wetland restoration projects. All of that stuff is, is really important to help naturalize the area. We talk about wetlands as nature's kidneys and you know they, they act as that filtration. So making sure that we've got adequate and, and working wetlands in the area is really important. Uh, and we do lots of other things where we're partners right now on uh, two programs. One is provincial called On Farm, and the other one is federal called Living Lab. Uh, so we are partners in that where we're doing actual in-field agricultural research and looking at the runoff from the fields so that we can have a better understanding of how nutrients leave the fields in our very specific areas. So here in Essex, we have flat clay plains versus um, up in Asobel and Maitland where they have more rolling terrain and different types of projects uh, that might happen there. We also sit on local, provincial, national, and international committees where we help to give that sort of local perspective. So I know myself, I, I sit on lots of international committees because of where I'm situated down here in Amherstburg, which is near Windsor and Detroit. So I have um, I spend as much time with my American colleagues as I do with my Canadian colleagues. Well, let me talk to one of your American colleagues right now. Howard, back <laughs> over to you. And uh, I want to circle back to that question I asked Patrick a little while ago, which is 50 years on, uh, while we're focused here on the challenges ahead and, and, and that you're currently facing, there are presumably some things we're celebrating, such as what, in your view? Well, there's a lot to celebrate. Patrick's completely right. The Clean Water Act was passed in the United States about 50 years ago, and it's been an enormous success. Anybody who spends their time around the Great Lakes, and the Great Lakes is where we live and we work and we play, has seen the difference. I mean, the industrial pollution was going directly through a pipe into Lake Michigan and Lake Erie. That's not happening anymore, or at least it's not supposed to be happening. Mm -hmm. When it does, it's a problem, and there's usually some legal action that gets taken by the regulatory agencies. But we're no longer looking at industrial pollution as a matter of course, running straight into the Great Lakes. Um, we have problems with invasive species, but some of the ones that have been bad problems are getting a little bit under control. So lots of progress. Mercury is being reduced that was getting into the lakes and causing all sorts of problems in the fish that we like to eat. Uh, we're making a lot of progress. We have new challenges. Agricultural runoff is increasingly a predominant part of the problem, as all three of us have been talking about. And the explosion of manure I mean, let's talk about that. You're talking about poop. You're talking about manure <laughs> going directly into the lakes where people swim, where animals go to lap the waters, where we hang out at the beaches, where people boat and canoe and kayak. And somehow it's become acceptable for there to be more manure created through these large animal operations that predictably get into the lake. That's a growing and emerging problem. We need to do something about it. The good news is that we've looked at the last 50 years and where there have been problems, we've developed solutions and we've taken actions. Maybe not as quickly as some people would like. And heck, I'm a public interest attorney. We're ambitious. We like to see things happen sooner rather than later. But I'm also an optimist. And what we've seen over the last 50 years is a real qualitative improvement in terms of the quality of the Great Lakes 
and the rivers and the lakes that surround them, we're getting better and we need to keep doing that. And we well, can do that if we all work together. Patrick, I don't want to be a killjoy here, but the reality is you've got two national governments involved in this. You've got a number of state and provincial governments involved in this, and you have indigenous or First Nations governments, which are also involved in this. Jurisdictionally speaking, is this too complicated to make progress on? Well, no, not really. If uh, Again, people just uh, use some good common sense. You know, Mother, uh, Mother Earth, uh, the water that flows through its veins that keeps us alive uh, is so crucial to everyone. I don't care if you're uh, the governor of uh, one of the states or uh, a mayor of a large city here, you have to drink water. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the folks that uh, are so short-sighted, you know, they usually don't last long. Uh, you know, I, I think the general public is getting more and more aware. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, things that's been talked about here is the proliferation of phosphorus and, and manure in the systems, but also, you know, just the sheer growth of uh, the urban, uh, you know, exodus into uh, you know the the, the outlying territories of uh, of the province, you know, and and the influx of just so many. Uh, structures and cottages around is just adding to the impacts and the pressures. So we've got to smarten up a little bit uh, all around. Everybody has to take uh, personal responsibility. Uh, I think if we're going to wait for the governments to do anything about it. Uh, you know, we've seen, we've had 50 years of, you know, some progress, but uh, the question is, you know, how are we going to, uh, you know, do better in the next uh, 50 and, uh, years and beyond? And it's everyone's responsibility. I don't think we can you know, lay this uh, responsibility on, on, on any one or two uh, levels of government. It's every person's responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to leave this, particularly mm -hmm. since, uh, Patrick, I don't want you to miss your flight, so we got to let you go so you can get to the airport. Uh, I want to thank the three of you for joining us here on TVO tonight. Howard Lerner, Patrick Madabi, Katie Stamler, it's been a great pleasure having you on. Happy 50th anniversary uh, to the Great Lakes Agreement and uh, 50 more of... Uh, more progress ahead, we hope. Take care, everybody. Awesome. Good to Thank join you. you. For many people, climate change feels a bit like a slow motion train wreck headed for all of us. Not surprisingly, it's on the minds of a lot of millennials and Gen Zs as they face the daunting tasks that lie ahead to deal with it. And that's where broadcaster and writer Britt Ray's new book plants its flag. It's called Generation Dread, Finding Purpose in an Age of Climate Crisis. She is Planetary Health Postdoctoral Fellow at the Stanford Center for Innovation in Global Health. And we're pleased to welcome Britt Ray to a ritual studio tonight from Los Gatos, California. Hi, Britt. Hi, so good to be here. So nice to see you again. Um, I wanted to start by talking about something that caught my attention because you mentioned it twice in the book, uh, once in the book and then once in the acknowledgments. You write, um, this book has been painful to write. Uh, how come? Oh, well, indeed. I am a science communicator and I have been studying, investigating the climate and water ecological crisis for Oh, well, since I was 17 and left home to study conservation biology in university, and then later since I became a reporter broadcasting uh, about what the anthropogenic impacts on the environment are now doing as they roll back to affect environmental and human health, and bearing witness to the climate crisis and other forms of threat, the biodiversity crisis, let's say, land transformation, what have you, bears a psychological toll for those of us who are professionally witnessing it eight plus hours a day, because very frustrating to know we have solutions that aren't being deployed by our leaders in order to maintain uh, alignment with scientific guidelines that will help protect our future, not only for humanity, but a bunch of non-human species as well that we're otherwise driving over the brink of extinction. That's painful in itself. So a lot of us unwittingly kind of participate in forms of soft denial around how dangerous this crisis is becoming. We have a lot of ways in which to stick our heads in the sand and be preoccupied with other things. But when you don't have those defenses at your disposal, when you're really digging into it, it's tough. It raises anxiety, grief, anger, sadness, and basically mental exhaustion and burnout. So those are the kinds of things that I've experienced while doing the writing for this book. 
you describe yourself as feeling like a sitting duck and some of the terms you've brought up we're going to get more into but i wanted to read something that you write in the book um you write it's the dread that's been hanging over me for the last few years uh it rains the heaviest when i speak with people much younger than me like the student climate strikers my nieces and nephews or the unborn child i so deeply want to have um you started gen Dre uh gen dread as a newsletter before it turned into a book what made you start the project so we are in a moment when eco-anxiety, which is really an umbrella term for a variety of distressing emotions a person can experience when confronting the climate and wider ecological crisis, not just anxiety, but you know, it's rage and, and grief and sadness and fear, sometimes even terror, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I wanted to be able to carve out a space in which people can take a tour of this landscape of rising eco-anxiety that we know is out there in society, find forms of dealing with it that are helpful for their own health, you know, coping that can produce the kind of psychological strength to deal with this, as well as importantly, harnessing the tools for collective constructive action out there in the wider society with others, which is the mental health intervention that's needed, climate action at the root, right? Mm -hmm. Beyond what any therapist can do with someone who's feeling stressed out in a clinical setting. And I knew this intimately because several years ago, my partner and I, when coming to that point in our life, when we were saying, hey, we, I think, really want to have a kid, uh, and we're addressing that in light of all of the climate reports that I read for a living and squaring that with the lack of effective bold act, and it birthed this painful dilemma for me around questioning whether or not I felt comfortable bringing another person into the world to deal with climate disruption. I needed to scrutinize my thoughts. I didn't know if my thinking was twisted or perhaps off base. I didn't see that fear really mirrored out in the society around me, nor in my friend group. And I started doing some research, uh, discovered very quickly this was a frothing, active conversation, relatively underground. But in the years since 2017, when I was having those first questions arise in me, it has exploded on the world scene as something that we now have activist movements formed around. We have young people in the street writing that they're refusing to reproduce on their placards until governments make it safe for them to do so by taking effective climate action. We have celebrities and politicians talking to this point and statistics. One study that my colleagues and I were involved in looked at the climate anxiety burden in 10,000 16 to 25 year olds in 10 countries around the world, including Nigeria, Philippines, India, but also US, UK, France, and a variety of countries in between, low, middle, high income settings. 39% of those global respondents say that their feelings about the climate crisis make them hesitant to have their own children. And so that was my on-ramp for looking at eco-anxiety, but it's a much wider phenomenon than just that reproductive piece. And I became curious about how this is showing up in diverse forms of people's lives, communities, and what people are doing to, to productively deal with this and channel it for the kinds of collective actions that we need. So yes, it did hang over me as a heavy emotion because when confronted with young people and feeling for them, feeling their sense of belittlement um, and disillusionment around this crisis as they don't sense that older generations are really heeding their concerns because they've inherited this, this crisis along with the duty to clean it up. What's needed are, are bridge builders of solidarity so that before it becomes too late, mm -hmm. um, we can do what's needed now in order to protect young people's futures in a robust way. Well, you write about the importance of embracing climate-related emotions like anxiety, fear, rage, and grief. Why is that? They are here with us, whether we like them or not. Often, we might try to ward off these uncomfortable feelings because it's difficult to sit with uncomfortable uh, emotional affects, and that's very reasonable and normal. However, as we are forced to bear witness to precious environments becoming degraded or dealing with incurring disasters that threaten people we love, maybe people who we are compassionate for, even if we never meet them, um, uh, non-human species, etc. We, of course, are going to pay a cost for that emotionally if we care, if we're connected to what's going on and not so numbed by unconscious defenses that we're not able to feel. And so eco-anxiety can be reframed as eco-compassion or a form of, of love um, that is showing us, you know, important information, something that we care for is deeply under threat. Therefore, we're feeling this. There's a quote about how bearing witness to suffering and imagining that it's not going to rub off on you is basically like 
walking through water and imagining that you're not going to get wet. Mm -hmm. And that's what is also relevant for this conversation about a rapidly warming world and changing environments that threaten our health. So we have to find ways of valuing this as not a pathology because it's not, it's not a medical disorder to have ego anxiety. It's not in the DSM. Mental health professionals argue that it should remain excluded. It's not um, to be cured. Instead, we need to find ways of valuing it, allowing it to be basically a compass showing us what we ought to alert our attention towards so that we can help do the work to reduce the threat. There's so much that can be done to reduce the harm and help heal these systems. Um, and therefore, when it becomes an important part of that journey, we see that grief isn't to be avoided, anxiety isn't to be avoided, but it's to be dealt with, folded into our lives, and then normalized because it's here. People are feeling this and we have to help each other through it. Uh, I want to read another passage from your book. Uh, you write, a striking feature of the climate bubble is that it has generally denied permission to talk about the climate crisis in emotional terms, particularly in highly influential places. This neutrality is achieved most easily by not speaking in energetically charged terms about the terrifying implications of climate disruption. You also write, um, the stress of what's happening to the planet is living inside people's bodies. Um, so how can acknowledging emotional alongside reason impact how we talk about the climate crisis? Right. So there I was riffing off of an interview that I had done with a former lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, which is put out by the UN, our most authoritative report describing what's going on with the climate that many thousands of scientific authors weigh in on. And she was saying that while throughout her entire impressive career, she has understood the dangers on a very visceral level of what's happening with the climate crisis. She's never felt comfortable conveying it in any emotional language to policymakers, to decision makers, to those in which she hopes her scientific information will have an impact so that it can affect real changes out there in the world because Time and again, when scientists do become somewhat of an advocate by speaking with any form of urgency on this, they get dismissed, they get written off as being radicals or alarmists, and people will say, oh, we know they're on the side of climate change disaster, so don't listen to what they have to say, which is, of course, hugely threatening. No one would want that to happen to their research, and therefore... The best way to protect it is to stay very buttoned up and never, ever bring in any aspect of that emotional human feeling portion and just speak in dry clinical language, pre present the gigatons and the graphs and call it a day. The problem is that that really doesn't convey the full human reality of what we're dealing with, which is that we can have troubling evidence that points out real dangerous scenarios and be full humans who can respond to it with an emotional appropriateness. And if we're going to be rational in the in science anyway. We need to recognize that people make decisions from irrational places. We are emotional decision makers, often even beyond what we um, do with our kind of systematic rational brains, as we like to think that we only make decisions from that standpoint, but we're, we're really <laughs> a mixture of the two. So allowing for that taboo to be lifted is important because how is the public supposed to support policy when scientists can't even speak their full truth in terms of how they're relating to the data when when non-experts might not know how to relate to this. And so um, that was the point I was making there in the sense of, I can hear you coming in, Nam, go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. It's I, I wish you were here in person because I thought it was so interesting because in the book when I was reading it, you say that uh, you never actually considered yourself a climate activist. Um, so is there a little bit of that, you know, you don't want to be considered that high, you're um, hypersensitive to it in the sense that if you do, if you are in the activism space, your work is not seen as credible. The same uh, thing you said about the scientists, like it's dehumanizing who they are by saying that they can't be emotional. Well, yeah, it's it's basically saying certain parts of you are allowed to work and the other parts aren't. But the problem is that it's increasingly straining and stressful for climate professionals to remain buttoned up in that way because there's a real mental exhaustion. There's a burnout that many professionals are reporting as part of the experience of doing this work. We've got classrooms of environmental studies students who are despairing and overwhelmed because of simply going through their educational modules. And what's not working is simply dealing with this information in rationalist boxes and not making space to also contain the emotions. And by containing them, that means 
is giving them a healthy space in which to be processed. Many environmental studies professors now are realizing that just by doing their work, they're leaving students hopeless and fatalistic about the future that they're apparently getting professional skills in to go work towards as environmental stewards. And what can be very helpful is to, instead of only talking about the science and the scary facts, is create a space in which to humanly process this through art, philosophy, the humanities, um, forms of conversation, and bringing in psychology. And when that happens, a flexible form of thinking can really alleviate the hopelessness and help people navigate this challenging material in ways that are more psychologically sustaining, building resilience. And similarly, we see that that could really help a lot of climate professionals who aren't students but have never been given permission to express that this stuff is emotionally draining. Mm -hmm. And so in the age of eco-anxiety, people are asking for resources about how to deal with this. And it can all be harnessed and channeled for more productive outcomes if we can have a bit more of an emotionally intelligent conversation about the fact that we're not just rational creatures. We also have this whole internal world which gets affected on those emotional levels. And I think, too, um, we connect through emotions, right? Because you refer to the climate crisis as a hyper object that encompasses all space and time, making it extremely difficult for people to comprehend or intervene. And you write about the different uh, forms of denial that exist. You argue that all of us participate in some degree of denial when it comes to the, crime, uh, the climate crisis, uh, yourself included. In what ways do we do that? Right. So the hyper object is this term from the philosopher Timothy Morton, which really helps to explain why we're pretty bad at thinking and talking about the climate crisis and dealing with it at all, because it's so vast and all encompassing that it extends beyond the normal idea of what it means to be a thing, right? It's plastic in the oceans. It's what's coming out of our tailpipe. If we drive a combustion engine car, it's concerns about future generations. It's in our energy bills. And so if we can't see where it stops or starts, how do we know where to locate ourselves and start to make a difference and intervene? Now, climate psychology tells us that we have tons of reasons why this is perpetuated. We have psychological defenses to protect us from anxiety and pain. And facing up to the full-on uh, reality of the climate crisis can raise anxiety as well as ambivalence about our own complicity in contributing to the problem in a variety of ways, depending on how we live and where we where we live, how we emit, what we do for work, and so on. And so um, instead of just the kind of straight up climate denial that we are very familiar with in terms of corporate lobbyists and political, uh, politically corrupt politicians conspiring with the fossil fuel industry that has been knowingly misleading the public on the dangers of the greenhouse effect for decades, we also have soft denial, which lives within many of us when we have one eye open to the truth and we really say this ought to be dealt with, it's a huge priority, and simultaneously we close the other eye and continue not making change and basically our ability to act is thwarted because we want to just continue with the status quo, which is comfortable right now in the present, at the expense of the future becoming quite terrifying if we don't have dramatic, bold action that we all have a role in helping to bring forth. So that's called disavowal. And the idea is just that, you know, these psychological defenses are healthy in general. We've evolved them to help protect us from discomfort. When reality is really tough to bear, we've always had to apply a little bit of self-delusion or wishful thinking to get by. But in this civilizational threat scenario that's not serving us and we really ought to be able to move beyond the ways that soft denial traps us so that we can get real with each other about all the power that we have in this moment to help heal these systems that are hurting us and improve the outcomes for the future. Well, this de this denial is also rooted in our disconnection to the in the environment, uh, which you reflected on in your book. You write, when we no longer see every bird, tree, or ladybug as worthy of our interest and engagement, we lose some of our own vibrancy as a living thing on this earth. Um, many of us are living in cities and depending on technologies. Uh, is it still possible for societies to shift perspective? I think it absolutely is possible. And a lot of us in this time have unlearning to do, right, in terms of what it means to consider humans at the center of all this web of incredibly sophisticated, adaptive, living creatures that are um, enmeshed in symbiotic relationships. There's mutualism. Humans require 
the natural ecosystems and other species in order to live ourselves. If that gets despoiled and falls away, there will be no humanity to speak of. And to be able to really um, deeply understand that is important, of course, for survival and also to enrich our lives on a level of what it means to just appreciate the, the incredible gift of being part of the wider web of life in itself. So moving from domination to partnership is something that's required to restore ecosystem health overall. It's allowing us to get beyond frames of extraction and industrialism that just look at what we can take from nature rather than how we can also inherently value it and not just see it as some kind of um, dollar sign in which to relate to and take from. And all in all, we're dealing with a planetary health crisis. It's much broader than just the climate crisis. It's water use, it's land transformation, it's biodiversity. And what we know from a variety of scientific fields is that the accumulating effects of our behavior is now rolling back uh, to bite us as the number one threat to human health, both in physical health and mental health. So, you know, given this threat, what are we going to do to protect ourselves? We can absolutely fundamentally change by shifting our worldviews, which is possible even if these other modes of domination feel really entrenched. It's just that we need to talk about this and work with especially communities that understand this and model other modes of being. Often, indigenous societies have been leading the way on this for hundreds of years, and there's a lot to be learned from ways of questioning dominant models and getting curious about others. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because you write about the importance and nuances of learning and applying Indigenous knowledge for the environment. And you write this, uh, Indigenous peoples are actively involved in a process of reconstructing, reconstituting, and recovering their traditions from the assimilating forces of colonization. How can one generally partner with others in a deeply unjust society? Did you find the answer through your research for that? Well, I found some starting ideas by interviewing um, an Indigenous philosopher named Kyle White, who wrote an article with other Indigenous uh, co-authors discussing how Indigenous knowledge is not simply for all humanity to take at this time, because there's an increasingly fervent request of their societies, their peoples and communities to be able to provide the life-sustaining knowledge that humanity needs in order to make it through a tough ecological crisis based in indigenous wisdom and these ideas of reciprocity and relating to nature in non-exploitative ways. And they write, well, yes, however, we continue to face oppression and our existence and continuance needs to be our primary concern. So we're not here simply to just load off information. It's like if you're trying to learn an instrument and every time you sit down to play and practice, someone says, recite for me, recite for me, when actually they need time in order to recover interrupted knowledge systems that settler colonialism has violently taken from them in a variety of ways. And so that uncomfortable truth brings up this question of what it means to partner in ways that aren't recentering uh, predominantly privileged people's needs at the expense of others who exist ongoing marginalization. And um, the conversation that I was able to learn is to really the question of asking, what can I do to assist in that story that is unfolding and benefit indigenous knowledge in a way that is mutually supportive um, and reciprocal rather than about once again taking and um, doing doing so on one's own terms. And then, you know, that form of allyship will determine whether or not knowledge is passed on. And um, importantly, it, indigenous knowledge systems are not simply to be thought of as some kind of big valuable um, component of, of human experience that's been overlooked or to be rebooted from the past. It's ongoing and to have dealt with everything that Indigenous peoples have endured for for generations, for, for centuries, means that there's been a wide portfolio of knowledge, including traditional knowledge and modern science and a variety of other systems as well. So it's, it's vibrant, it's ongoing. And through that evolution, um, really interesting forms of, of allyship and partnership can come to the fore right now in the march for, for planetary health in an intersectional way that, that helps all people. So um, much more. I, I wouldn't say that that's just one, uh, one answer for solving such a huge problem, but it's a really generative place to start considering what it means to shift from domination to partnership.
But some people might say that people are using, are getting the identity of I'm not having kids because of the climate crisis. Maybe you weren't going to have kids anyway, but in the book you write, there are different models to parent and have families. Um, how would those communities look like? Well, there are a variety of modes of family making that go beyond the narrow Western conception of a nuclear family with two adults and however many kids they have living in their private pod. There are indigenous kinship systems. There are queer chosen families. There are ways of building houses with multiple parents who are not necessarily each other's lovers and having kids between them with lifelong relationships. I mean, family is much more um, alive and vibrant as a concept than we often bring in an initial assumption of what it means to biologically reproduce. In the climate crisis, many people talk about adoption if they don't feel comfortable having their own kids biologically because of environmental concerns. At the same time, many climate aware people who are concerned about what young people are going to have to deal with are having kids, knowing that it puts a stake in the ground for them to continue working on this problem no matter what. And in the book, I really try and reflect on what it means to have kids amidst existential threat, which humanity has always been dealing with, whether you're living under an authoritarian regime or with the stresses of colonization or under the threat of slavery. I mean, there are so many moments in history by which it's not been easy to bring kids into the world, and yet they are brought in as a mode of continuance and being able to transmit culture and identity. And so it's no different here now. It's just that I think there's growing conversation deserves being contained. That means given a safe place in which these questions can be asked so that people can reckon with their fears about what's going on with the climate crisis and not feel shame for connecting family planning to it in the first place. Britt, thank you so much. You've uh, started a lot of conversations that are going to get people thinking in different ways. We really do appreciate your time and congratulations on your book. It's excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, June 28th, 2022. Reducing stigma around mental health has taken enormous effort over a protracted period. But some experts now see reason to worry that increased patient focus on getting a diagnosis might suggest a new problem. And we're looking at that tomorrow. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.